Welcome to Baseball Seasons 1995. Baseball returns. Go crazy, folks! Go crazy! It stood against everything else the sports world, and baseball in particular, had been feeding the country. The simplest of ethics a man goes to work every day and works as hard as he can. And how well this man did it how long he did it, and how he went about it, just may have saved the game. And let it be said that number eight, Cal Ripken Jr., has reached the unreachable star. People that are going out there and working every day uh, can relate to Cal. For those that are wondering if baseball is out there and people still love it, cherish it, yeah. But when you just give us baseball. We all respected Cal. We all respect what he was as a player, what he brought to the ballpark every day, the respect that he had for the game and that people had for him and how he handled himself. I mean, you couldn't help but root for this guy. When you treat it as gently as Cal Ripken has treated it for his entire career, you really learn to appreciate the game. He embodied what a lot of people felt when they came to the baseball field, work ethic, desire, stick to itiveness, and he certainly is what baseball can thank for the repair job of really what was a devastation. On the field of dreams, a giant anti-climax. Well, there is no joy in Mudville tonight or anywhere else baseball. So for the first time since 1904, a baseball season concludes. It is over. No postseason games, no World Series. We're forced into this situation. And we're going to stick with our decisions. I thought we left the door open. I thought we were making some progress and talking about some real issues. I don't know what I think. Uh, you know, it's, it's very easy for fans to be frustrated. We're frustrated. The low point for the strike, obviously, was when the World Series got canceled. For all of us in baseball, uh, the players included, we just we didn't know what was going to happen beyond that. So all I can say to all of you uh, in the end is uh, I'm really sorry. I wish this day, obviously, had never happened. It's a sad day for certainly all the players for all baseball fans and we just have to try and find a way to get this put back together as soon as we can early on people would pick sides it's the owner's fault it's the players fault but when the world series was canceled people were really angry i, I think basically that the fans have been shortchanged get your butt out there i think they're just being selfish between the two of them the world series was just one casualty of baseball's 1994 strike the stoppage also cut short a year of potentially record-breaking performances. Junior with a high drive to deep right field. Gone! High blast by Williams and goodbye. He is on track to chase Roger Maris. It's a card down the right field line and in there. Tony Gwendy hitting up into the 390s. It dragged on through the fall, the winter, and early spring. But after 232 days, just as replacement players prepared for opening day, there was a breakthrough. Good evening. The clubs are delighted to announce we have accepted the union's unconditional offer to return to work. I was proud that we were back, but I knew that we needed to restore confidence amongst our fans and make sure that people understood this was permanent. The players are back. The game is back, and we are very happy about that. A 144-game season was hastily scheduled. Baseball in 1995 would begin at the end of April, following an abbreviated and delayed spring training. Going into spring training, we only had a very limited amount of time. I think it was 10 days to two weeks to actually get started for the 95 season. Oh, go, go! As players worked their way into shape, there was a flurry of front office activity. The new faces in new places included slugger Larry Walker in Colorado and closer John Wetland joining the Yankees in New York. Everything that you worked for last year and all the time and dedication and things were going our way kind of gets erased and you got to start all the way over. It's kind of like being uh, head of the race for two thirds of it and say, oh, oh, we had a false start. Just as eager to restart were the Cleveland Indians. 
a team with an explosive young offense that had begun to come of age in 94. Don't, don't get scared now. The party's just beginning. It's nice to be out in the negotiating rooms and to be uh, on the field, and hopefully we'll be here for a long time. After three straight division titles, but no World Series championship to show for it, the pitching rich Atlanta Braves had ended 1994 in second. This team had come so close that, you know, everybody's goal here was, you know, to go to the World Series and win. There, strike three. As long as baseball's played, as long as we don't mess with the integrity of it and change too many rules, the game itself always wins out. We, the players, were happy to be back on the field and playing. Uh, there was some sense of normalcy for us, but there wasn't a sense of normalcy for the fans. On April 25th, 1995, Major League Baseball made its belated return to stadiums across the country. The delayed start kept some fans away. But the ones who came were rewarded with a simple but familiar sense of opening day. Nowhere more so than Colorado, where the two-year-old Rockies were opening brand new Coors Field. Take me out to the ball game. Take opening day special souvenir program scorecard lineups. Peanuts and Cracker Jack. The enthusiasm, the excitement of this opening day is as good as any I've been around. Right? Baseball's back. Yeah, baseball. If they don't win, it's a shame. For it's one, two, three strikes, you're out at the old ball game. After the pageantry was complete, the Rockies and Mets engaged in something already familiar to fans in Colorado, a mile-high seesaw shootout featuring 33 combined hits and extending into extra innings. It is 9 to 8 for the Mets, the last of the 14. 43 players have been used in this game. One would have the final word. Dante Bichette, one for five for the run batter in and a double. You know, I was just trying to lock in and just trying to zero in on, uh, on getting a good pitch to hit. George and Bichette pressing a little bit tonight. Well, it's, it seems like he's trying to hit the ball out of the ballpark. That's what I went to play for. I went to the play for one thing, and that was to hit a home run and win that game. A high drive. Way back. And there's the storybook ending for the Rockies. I mean, it was such a relief and just such a pump when I hit that thing. I just had to clinch my fist. I was really excited about the hit. Bichette was one of a host of big bats in the Rockies lineup as was newcomer Larry Walker, eager to test the limits of the Rockies' new ballpark. This is right field, uh, a little different than Olympic Stadium, huh? Well, yeah, it, uh, it looks a little larger out here. I'm hoping I'll get made look like a fool sometimes. Not you, Larry. Add in Vinny Castilla and Andres Galarraga, and the Rockies had an altitude-friendly lineup that would keep them in contention all year long. That ball's going! It ain't coming back! Rockies win the game! But there was no team in baseball with a more dangerous collection of hitters than the Indians. In fact, top to bottom, Cleveland's lineup was one of the best of its generation. You look at the Cleveland Indians lineup, and it was an all-star lineup. You have to look with a microscope for the flaws in this Indians team. In that lineup, it's, it's one of those things where you say you, you can run, but you can't hide because those guys were that good. The seventh, eighth, and ninth hitters in this lineup have numbers comparable to the heart of the order for lesser teams. I attribute so much of the success we had to uh, the great players that we had. With all of those great players, there is a story uh, behind all of them. That story started at the top of the order with Kenny Lofton, a versatile table setter who had led the league in stolen bases his first three years in Cleveland. There goes Lofton. And who kept the mood light with a unique brand of humor. Wipe on, wipe off. Following Lofton in that lineup was a modern day murderer's row. The 95 Indians could have been compared to the 27 Yankees. The offensive ability of, of that club anchored by Albert Bell. How hot is he? It was just up and down that lineup that you saw these players. Bell was one of several homegrown Cleveland products in the lineup. 
And he was supported by emerging stars Jim Tomey and Manny Ramirez. Ramirez spanks one. And it is gone. The Jacobs Field magic is back. The explosion of offense that had begun in 1994 was one thing the strike could not halt. And with the most powerful attack in baseball, the Indians raced off to a 33 and 11 start and a big lead in their division. Only one other team, it soon became apparent, might be able to challenge Cleveland for the title of best team in baseball. This squad, however, was winning in completely the opposite way. Early on in the 1995 baseball season, there was no question. The game's offensive explosion was here to stay. And that is way out of here. The second home run of the inning. Three home runs in one game. Never was this more evident than on Saturday, May 6th, when more total runs were scored in the National League than any previous day in history. Final score, 13-11. It seemed like on any given night, something new could happen at the plate. And more grand slams would be hit in 95 than any season before it. There it goes, way back it is! Gone! Another grand slam, Robin Ventura! His second in two innings! Still, though, in one place. The rallying calls were coming for great pitching. Well, I think what made us so dominant in 1995 was a combination of pitching, hitting, and defense. But the pitching was fantastic. We outpitched everybody. John Small strikes out the side. We had the ability to, to throw four and five guys out there every single night that gave us a chance to win. The Braves starters are all interchangeable in that they could all be number one starters on any given day. When you go to Atlanta, you knew that that staff was probably one of the most efficient. Another complete game, another shutout. The Braves' rotation was tremendous. He was overmatched. There was the craftiness of Tom Glavin. Glavin has been masterful. The power of John Smoltz and Steve Avery. Got him. And the otherworldliness of Greg Maddox. The thing about Greg Maddox in 1995, he never made a bad pitch. Not one. He just won't give you a pitch to hit, folks. That's why he's the best pitcher in the game. There's no way to describe it. You get in a groove, you get on a roll, and you just keep going. The challenge of hitting a guy like that, it's tough. I mean, he could put the ball exactly where he wanted to put it. He wants it outside. Let's see where Maddox pitches it. Look at that. Outside. What control. As the rest of the league put up startling hitting numbers, the Braves were a team from another era hungry to earn the one missing item on their resume. They've won four division championships. There's only one other thing to do. Mm -hmm. That's get to the World Series and win it. While those four big names resided in Atlanta, there were a handful of other pitchers making an impact in 95, including two formidable brothers from the Dominican Republic. Back east, Ramon's younger brother, Pedro, was a bright spot for the Expos. There's a change up. Never more so than on June 3rd, when he took a perfect game into extra innings. Pedro was pitching against the uh, San Diego Padres, and it was quite obvious from the beginning of the game he was going to be difficult to deal with. Struck him out. Pedro Martinez is perfect through nine. Pedro got to the 10th inning with the no hitter attack and gave up a hit to Biff Roberts leading off the inning. Roberts lines the ball right field. It's going to drop in. And the bid for the perfect game comes to an end in the 10th inning. You could see he was becoming more and more valuable with each start. But the pitcher receiving the most attention in 1995 wasn't just striking out hitters. Swing and a miss. He struck him out. He was ushering in a new era in the game. So, this is あの、
I want you to learn how to say this. Say, I, I bleed, bleed Dodger, Dodger Blue. blue. <laughs> Hideo Nomo may have been a quick learner, but his unique style was giving hitters fits around the league. He had just a, a very much different rhythm than other pitchers. He comes up like this, he puts his hands and stops straight right here. And then when he makes a pivot, it's just a straight pivot. So he shows his whole back to the hitter, and that's the toughest thing about him, I think. At the All-Star break, leading the league in strikeouts with a 1.99 ERA. Nomo was the game's most talked about player. And the NL starter in the Midsummer Classic. Less than four months removed from the picket lines, the game's players were front and center in its recovery. See, cool off, see? Stars like Frank Thomas, the White Sox slugger, and two-time defending most valuable player. Thank you guys very much. And Mo Vaughn, the Red Sox first baseman, who was putting together his own case for MVP in Boston. Drives that one to left field. Serious as ever. And then there was the shortstop in Baltimore. Taking minimal swings in batting practice and conserving my energy who simply by taking the field was bringing fans back to baseball one game at a time. As the summer of 1995 continued to unfold, the focus tightened on the standings. As we got into the season and talk became less and less about what happened and, and what led up to this and, and how would uh, a shortened season be viewed by the fans and by, by history. And it became more and more about what was going on in baseball and what were the pennant races shaping up to be. Struck him out. They were shaping up well for Glavin's Braves, who had taken over the NL East lead in early July and were showing no signs of looking back. The Braves have done it again. Meanwhile, the talk of the American League was still Cleveland as the Indians continued to pile up runs and wins. Line to center field. Back is Edmonds. Tawani track to the wall. It's gone. A grand slam. Hold on. The magic continues. The Indians win. There were others enjoying their summers as well, like Mo Vaughn and the Sox, who used a 12-game win streak in August to pull away in the East. In 95, I think it was good chemistry. Before you know it, we were, you know, from last to first. By Labor Day, the Reds had established control of their division, led by MVP candidate Barry Larkin, one of the best all-round players in the game. He wasn't flashy. Larkin's gonna try to gun him down, and he gets him. He didn't have any gimmicks. There goes Larkin. Well, get him, and Lark has his 15th stolen base. He just came out, and he played baseball hard. Another notable development of 95 was that players on teams outside of first place were also playing hard, thanks to a controversial change in the playoff format. We kept expanding, and we just couldn't have a format in which only the division winners won. And so we needed to create a situation where we had additional teams in the playoffs. In 94, baseball's realignment had created three divisions in each league. The winner of each division would advance to the playoffs. Of the remaining teams, the one with the best record in each league would win the wild card and make the postseason. It was a format that would inevitably offend baseball purists. When I first heard that Major League Baseball was going to the wild card system, I started thinking to myself, okay, I guess Satan is alive. I was offended because the great thing about baseball. Got him. Oh, he just blows him away. The element that separates us from all other sports. Sorry. We have to play 162 games. Oh, what a remarkable play by Conine. And if that doesn't determine who's the best team. And there's one that's way out of here. And who ought to go to the World Series, nothing ought to. And I, that's how I felt at first. But as I began to see the impact that it had on the number of communities. And it is gone! And the fan base in a number of ball, uh, clubs where they were just sort of battling to get in the playoffs. Here comes Junior with up with the ball. His throw to the plate. He is safe. The ball pops. 
they kept their enthusiasm in their communities, the players continue to play hard, and it began to show its value. That value was apparent all over baseball. In late May, the Seattle Mariners had lost Ken Griffey Jr. to a broken wrist. But with the wild card in play, they were able to tread water behind the Angels. In August, uh, we were quite a ways back from the Angels that year, but we still had a chance because of the wild card. And it was really the first time in Mariner history where the front office had a chance to make a few moves to help the club as opposed to try to offload players. Swing and a miss. One of the key acquisitions was speedster Vince Coleman, acquired from the Kansas City Royals. It was like being a rebirth for me again, because once I got there with Ego Martinez and Tino Martinez and King Gifford Jr., and we started winning ball game after ball game. Coleman, it's a fly ball deep to right field, and that's going to fly! A grand slam home run! Oh, it really gave an incentive to all these other teams that were on prior years, had no shot of making it into the postseason, but now they have really something to play for. In New York, there was plenty to play for. The Yankees were desperate to get the ailing and aging captain Don Mattingly to the playoffs for the first time in his career. And in late July, a game below 500, the team got 94 Cy Young winner David Cohn from Toronto to bolster their rotation. And he got him. The excitement, the enthusiasm, how ready and hungry the Yankee fans were for postseason baseball again. From there, it just only grew. As the summer came to a close, a dozen teams had shots at the wild card. And teams like the Rockies, making a bid for the postseason in just their third year in existence, had a cushion as they tried to hold off L.A. in the NL West. Deep to right center, forget about it. Look at that one. But as Labor Day beckoned, the spotlight of the game shifted away from the standings to the record book and the enduring star about to make history in Baltimore. It was a journey that had begun on May 30th, 1982. The shortstop, number eight, Patel Ripken. 13 years later, it was coming to a climax. In baseball, timing is integral. And as the summer of 95 continued, it was clear Cal Ripken had perfect timing. If I wanted to, to get used to playing every day, used to playing uh, in front of 52,000 people, the, the big stadium. Well hit, ball to left field, his 20th home. He had been Rookie of the Year in 82, and then MVP and a World Series champion in 83. Line drive, Ripken catches it at shortstop, and the Orioles are the champions of the world. And over the next decade plus, Ripken wasn't just one of baseball's best players. He became its modern-day Iron Man, never, ever missing a game. He's a regular guy and he believed in this good old-fashioned work ethic that I'm supposed to do something, so that's what I'm gonna do. Tonight's a landmark for Cal Ripken Jr. He reaches number 1,500 in his consecutive game streak. It's just uh, a little bit of luck and a lot of desire. Now playing in 2,000 consecutive games in a row, Cal Ripken. The 94 strike had pushed back when Ripken would break Lou Gehrig's all-time record just when fans were searching for a reconnection to the game. The love of the game was kind of broken between the players and the fans. And I felt that from early on, the fans were looking or searching for something to tie them to baseball that kind of goes back when it was just pure and when it was a game. And I think the streak started to represent that. Ripken continues his march toward Lou Gehrig's record. 50 games shy. you got to marvel at what he does day in and day out. It's now an official ball game, so the banner counts down one more game. Cal Ripken is a hero. Oh, man. That's exactly right. 2,128 straight games. I think it's great what he's doing. It's never going to be broken ever again. It's just great. <laughs> For me as a kid, Kyle Ripken was everything. He could do it all. I loved watching him play, and watching him play every single day, every single inning almost every day was pretty incredible. On September 5th, Ripken pulled even with Garrett with a dramatic burst of power. Kyle sends one high in the air to left center field. It's gone! After 21.30, uh, I remember going to bed that night. It was very late, and I was thinking, okay, tomorrow will come. And uh, there was a sense of relief that it would. 
the record that everyone thought would forever stand will be broken 56 years after Lou Gehrig said it. Camden Yards filled up early. Everyone, it seemed, wanted to pay tribute to Rifkin. He's a guy who just showed up and gave 100% every single day for years and years and years. He was baseball's everyman. You knew what was at stake, but you had no idea of how that was all going to play out. I think that's one of the greatest things about sports. The magic began in the fourth, when Ripken again punctuated the festivities. Rip to left! Oh, my goodness! He's done it again! It was a blast into the Baltimore night. And by now, the amazing was almost expected. What began on May 30th, 1982, and continues September 6th, 1995. This game is now in the books. Once it got to that point, they dropped the banner, and I remember uh, coming out and acknowledging the fans, and they just kept clapping. And I do remember Rafael Palmero saying, you have to take a lap around this field, or we won't be able to get our game started again. So I started to run down and shake hands really fast. And then I realized that there was a real beauty in this interaction. That 20 minute victory lap, which by the way, I think Cal milked because there's no reason to stay out there 20 minutes. I was tired standing up for 20 minutes, Junior. You got your play, it was all good. But the idea of that special interaction between Cal and the fans and that outpouring of emotion, it was awesome. A moment that will live for 2,131 years. We will never see anything like this again. I know that if Lou Gehrig is looking down on tonight's activities, he isn't concerned about someone playing one more consecutive game than he did. Instead, he's viewing tonight as just another example of what is good and right about the great American game. Thank you. A man had gone to work for 2,131 consecutive days. But more games were ahead, for the excitement of 1995 was just beginning. By the time the cheers finally died down for Cal Ripken, baseball's first ever playoff race in the wild card era had taken center stage. Some teams were coasting into the playoffs, like the Braves led by Greg Maddox, en route to his fourth straight Cy Young Award. He is the best, folks. He is the best. By season's end, Maddox would have 19 wins and a minuscule 1.63 ERA. You look back and see what his numbers were, and you see that he was able to win 19 games in a shortened season. Who knows how many games he would have won. Got him, took something off. Meanwhile, the Reds captured the NL Central, with Barry Larkin finishing up his virtuoso campaign and earning MVP honors. I had a great offensive year, a great defensive year. Stole some bases, was on base a lot, I scored 117 runs. He brings everything to the table. It was a great season for the team. We did make it to the playoffs, and that's what you play the game for. Larkin's AL MVP counterpart was Mo Vaughn, who led Boston to the AL East crown. Mo Vaughn is doing some last-minute campaigning. To win an MVP that year was tremendous. I'll always remember uh, 1995. But the unquestionable class of the American League was Cleveland. And as that magical season continued, there were individual milestones in Cleveland as well. Eddie Murray has reached 3,000. Mason has saved himself a record. Albert Bell, 50 homers, 50 doubles. No player has ever done that. With 100 wins in the shortened season, the incredible Indians became the fastest team ever to clinch. Not every team that got to the postseason coasted in, and the races were all the more complex with the wild card now in play. In the NL West, 
the Rockies' homer-happy lineup couldn't stave off Hideo Nomo and the surging Dodgers. Welcome to first place. But thanks to baseball's new playoff format, the Rockies would make the postseason. They've done it! The Rockies have done it! Their wildest dreams have come true by way of the wild card. They are in the playoffs! Even more drama, though, was transpiring in the AL, thanks to a team that baseball had seemingly forgotten about. We had just lost a vote to get a new stadium and to keep the Mariners in town, and so we're on the brink of maybe moving to Tampa Bay. So I knew the fans were behind us, but we had to figure out a way to help save them. For a team that had only finished above 500 twice in their history, Ken Griffey's return spearheaded their simple mission, win. August 24th, 1995 began the turnaround. Now Griffey unloads to deep right, the game is over. Junior put this swing on a pitch from John Wetland. The Seattle Mariners in. Dramatic fashion have defeated the Yankees 9 to 7. And I'm telling you, the kingdom just erupted. As did the Mariners, who began winning ball games and creeping up on the first place Angels. And riding around the tag is Admiral Pie! Oh my! But with the wild card in play, the race had added intrigue. As back east, Cohn, Mattingly, and the Yankees had caught fire as well. We just caught a great streak at the, at the last, you know, the last month of the season. We had some tough games that we won. The Yankees have taken a 4-3 lead. I think that really put a lot of confidence in our group. After 144 games, on the last day of the season, the Yankees became the first American League wild card, earning their captain his first playoff appearance. Don Mattingly finally going to the postseason. It would take one more game, though, to determine how the West would be won. With the Mariners and Angels deadlocked, a one-game playoff would be held. Welcome to the Seattle's Kingdom, where 52,000 tickets were sold in about 18 hours. A historic afternoon in baseball. One game to decide the American League West. Randy Johnson took the hill on three days rest, but arm fatigue clearly wasn't a concern. Struck him out. Strike three calls. Starting to run out of time. One to nothing, Seattle. Close ball game, one nothing lead going to the bottom of the seventh inning. Bases are loaded. And here comes Luis Soho. Swing the ground ball up the first baseline, and it sneaks down by Snow. Down the right field line into the bullpen. Here comes Tino. Here comes Tino. Here comes Joy. The relay behind Langston. It's on by Allenson. Flora scores. Here comes Soho. Soho is still running. The Mariners built a 9-1 lead, and with two outs in the ninth, Randy Johnson was one pitch away from capturing the AL West title. The Seattle Mariners are the champions of the American League West. Postseason play, first time for the division series. As the first baseball postseason in two years began, the creation of the wild card meant three rounds of play, with the opening series a best of five. Best of five is one of the toughest series to win because, you know, any team can match up with you in a best of five. I was a big opponent of the wild card. Whether you agree with the wild card or not, you can always find beneficiaries. It's nice to see Don Mattingly get his chance. He's been a great player. It's been a tremendous relief for me, um, you know, personally to get in, to get rid of that asterisk. That seems like it's always heaped with my name. It's Don Mattingly's first postseason experience as a Yankee after all those great years. I remember him running out, getting a thunderous standing ovation. Number 23, Don Mattingly. Mattingly's first postseason was also the Yankees' first in 14 years, and for their opponent, their first ever in franchise history. Mariners did everything they could to get to the playoffs. They had to use Randy Johnson in that one-game playoff, so the big unit was out. Without the big unit, the Mariners relied on their biggest bat. Rips a deep! Goodbye home run hitting the facade of the upper deck. The elite players, it's got an unbelievable way of when the game gets going, even in pressure-packed situations, they can bring the game to them. And Junior did it, it seemed like every game. Swing and a drive deep to right field. Goodbye baseball. This ball game is tied at four. He is carrying them in game one. 
despite Junior's two home runs. Sierra deep right field. Eight the four Yankees. The Yankees took game one. You always like to, especially in a five-game series, to be able to get the first under your belt. But, you know, a long way to go. The next night, after waiting his entire career for a chance to play in the postseason, Mattingly took matters into his own hands. This one by Mattingly. Oh, hang on to the roof. Home run. Don Mattingly. 1,785 regular season games, and that's a home run try. Game two was a classic back and forth battle, setting the tone for one of the most memorable series in playoff history. 12th inning, Junior hits a home run. Home run, he has done it again. 5-4, Seattle lead. Bottom of the 12th inning, Ruben Sierra hits a double. Off the top of the wall, home run, and Yankees can win it. Bernie Williams tries to score the winning run. Oh, they got it. it's tied up. And we go to the 15th inning. Went up stepped Yankee catcher Jim Lairitz, establishing his clutch playoff credentials with one swing of the bat. Maybe, it could be, back in the wall. Goodbye, home run. The Yankees win. Jim Lairitz, a two-run homer in the 15th inning. Yankees win 7-5. to five. Mariners have their hearts broken. You fight so hard through an entire season and all the great things that happened, and all of a sudden, you're not going to win a playoff game? Uh, that is a long flight home. I'll never forget getting on the plane. Luke and Alex said, you know what, Rick? We're going to win this thing. Please. We got to win tonight and not worry about tomorrow. We got to win tonight. Please. And now they will have to go to the big guy, Randy Johnson, to keep him alive. Please. Never refuse to lose. And in game three, the big unit took the mound to save Seattle's season once again. It seems like Randy Johnson has always been able to rise to the occasion. Here comes Mr. Snappy. Strike three call. He got a bookie. The all two pitch. Swing and a miss. Strike three. He did it. Johnson struck out 10 Yankees in seven innings before the Mariners' bullpen finished the job. Swing on an ass, and there will be it tomorrow. Now it's 2 1. And then all of a sudden you're like, hey, you never know what can happen. And in game four, the Mariners pull even. I could still see the flight of the ball. And that white ball just went poof into that blue tarp. And it sent a ripple of emotion throughout the kingdom that went just absolutely nuts. Then game five. Game five, game five, game five. The Northwest has never, ever seen anything like this. As dramatic a game as it ever been played, game five is burned into every Mariners fan's memory. In the finale, the biggest names once again turned in the greatest performances. Mattingly, who'd hit 417 in the series, delivered a go ahead double late. But then Griffey ignited a game tying rally with his fifth homer of the series. Then came Johnson out of the bullpen on a day's rest to snuff out the Yankees in the ninth. Andy Johnson comes in and puts the Yankees away in the ninth. But the big unit wasn't invincible, and the Yanks got to him in extra innings. Base hit. Kelly coming around. He's going to score. The Yankees lead it now. The 1995 Mariners, though, were never a team to go quietly. As long as they had outs, they had life. into first base with a dive and the Mariners have the winning run at the plate in junior. Get on the ground. Race it. Scampers to third base and the Mariners still refuse to lose. The fans now reaching an incredible decibel.
been a series that Mariner fans are going to be talking about for the ages. That's when baseball was born here. People write me letters and let me know where they were at that particular moment. It's like your first love, something you will never forget. I remember watching Junior around second base. He wasn't stopping for nothing. He's just running like a deer. He's just bouncing. He's not really touching the ground. And then to watch him get absolutely smothered on the bottom of the pile and then see this head pop out with this smile from ear to ear it was the greatest feeling I ever had. That was the hit, the run, the game, and the season that saved baseball in Seattle. Without that dramatic run, without the emotion behind it, his team would have moved to Tampa. Nobody wanted to leave. Everybody was kissing and hugging. Nobody wanted to leave the ballpark. The pure joy, the pure emotion of the Mariners and the fans, it was just unbelievable. As the 95 playoffs continued, drama gave way to dominance as the Indians did away with the exhausted Mariners in the ALCS. And the Cleveland Indians, after a 41-year wait, are in the World Series. The Braves also rolled, allowing the Reds only five runs in a four-game sweep at the LCS. Great pitching here from the Atlanta Braves. We can't say anything other than that. They have a dominant pitching staff. But that pitching had brought no titles to Atlanta, and not for lack of opportunity. The Atlanta Braves, a team that's in the World Series for the third time in the last five seasons. They had been knocking on the door there for a few years and really needed to win to show that they weren't the team that could get there but not win. When it came to being choke teams, the Atlanta Braves were the Brooklyn Dodgers. They couldn't win the big one. In their way, the Indians' offensive juggernaut, standing in stark contrast to the Braves' pitching machine. When you started to break down the series, it was going to become, could we handle their offense? Would that old adage of good pitching beats good hitting come true? The Braves' ace offered his own answer to the question in game one. And that's grounded to short. Soft grounded to short. That's chopped toward the middle. The Indians have yet to hit a ball out of the infield. To have a guy almost like Albert Einstein in terms of his brilliance, in terms of his pitching strategies, it was remarkable. Nobody in baseball can carve up a lineup like Greg Maddox. Inside corner, outside corner, it's a clinic. Maddox went the distance, holding the Indians to just two hits. Giving chases Jones, and he makes the catch to give the Braves the win. Dial M for victory. In game two, Tom Glavin matched Maddox, quieting the Cleveland offense for a second straight game. Called strike three. Two strikeouts in the inning. The Indians were now hitting just 125 in the World Series, putting themselves in a very difficult position. It's 2 0 Atlanta. That adage about good pitching stopping good hitting has never been truer than in this postseason. You know, obviously it's the best position we could possibly be in, and uh, now it's just up to us to take advantage of it. But as the series went to Cleveland, the slumbering bats were quickly aroused at Jacobs Field. Hit hard toward the middle. It's through. This gal is going to score. He lines it into some. The Indians are back in the World Series. Never have to worry about getting the crowd involved here at Jacobs Field. And he's gone. 450 feet. This is what they do best. The Indians took two out of three in Cleveland. Back to Georgia. But still, the Braves were headed home with a three games to two lead. A win away from a championship. They are mindful that this thing is far from over, and the Cleveland Indians made that clear at Jacobs Field. Tonight, the Atlanta Braves trying to finally win the championship that has barely eluded their grasp. Our club had come so close to becoming world champions in 91 and 92 that these veterans on this club, especially Tommy in that game, were not going to be beaten. Fans are cheering Tom Glavitt, imploring him to deliver this team's first World Series title. Struck him out. He punches him out. He was a master at zoning in, and that's what he did. He locked in on the strike zone. Got him swinging for his third strikeout in the first two frames. Game six is the best game that I've ever pitched. Drop another one down. That's the kind of game that you look back on as a pitcher, and you'd feel good about it had I pitched it in July, let alone in the sixth game of the World Series. Glavin is working on a masterpiece for the Braves. One of the great performances that we'll see in, in the World Series game. Seven strikeouts to five. Hasn't allowed the Indians a hit. I knew that I wasn't going to give up many runs and kind of urged my teammates to get me a run. Fortunately, David Justice listened. A long drive to right. Ramirez turns to the track. She's gone. 
Oh, with just a little bit of breathing room. Sometimes that's all you need. Strikeout number eight for Glavin. Tommy Glavin said, I'm going to show you the kind of bulldog competitor that I am. And he absolutely shut down the Indians. The most feared offense in baseball all year long held to one hit. Left center field. Grissom on the run. The team of the 90s has its world championship. This organization was built on pitching, and a one to nothing victory got us our World Series win. Finally, the one missing piece is in place. So many things flash through your mind. The missed opportunities we had in previous World Series, the strike, the bitterness, to now here we were, and World Series champions. It was just an overwhelming feeling. For a single moment, for a single day, for a single year, we felt like we were on top of the world. For the Atlanta Braves, 1995 was their fourth consecutive trip to the postseason. The streak would eventually reach 14 before ending in 2006. However, 1995 would remain their only world championship. The Cleveland Indians also saw continued success, reaching the World Series again in 97. But they fell to the Florida Marlins in seven games. In the center field, the Florida Marlins have won the World Series. As of 2009, Cleveland has now gone 60 years without a world title. Meanwhile, after their dramatic series, both the Yankees and Mariners would enjoy more success. The Yankees are champions of baseball! Joe Torre took over as Yankee manager in 1996, and the next Yankee dynasty was born. New York would win four of the next five World Series. The Seattle Mariners' miracle run in 95 paved the way for construction of a new, state-of-the-art ballpark. In it, the Mariners' on-field success continued, culminating in a record-setting 116-win season in 2001. Then there was Cal Ripken Jr.'s streak, which would continue until September 20th, 1998, when at 2,632 games, he decided it was time for a day off. The Yankees were the first ones to kind of realize that I wasn't on the field. They all gave me a standing ovation, which started this trickle effect around the whole stadium. It still gives me goosebumps when I think about it. Three years earlier, Ripken had erased the bitterness of the strike by simply coming to work. By the time Ken Griffey slid home in Seattle, that bitterness was all but gone. In 1995, baseball came back from the brink, and that was the biggest triumph of all.